So before I kind of start, let me first thank the Planning Committee of NIAA. This is a great organization, one that I've uh, been associated with and have great admiration for. Uh, and I appreciate the invitation very much. Uh, before I start, let me give you uh, my caveats. So my caveats uh, before I kind of give this presentation is that uh, I'm uh, not an expert in antimicrobial resistance. Uh, it's not a course of what I've studied. I didn't do research in it. Um, however, I've been involved with it for a long time. It's partly why I have gray hair. No, not quite that bad. But I've worked on it from a point of view of a practitioner, from uh, a USDA point of perspective when Ron DeHaven and I actually had the same job in Washington running a regulatory agency, uh, being involved with FDA and other agencies, from uh, CDC's point of view, running a national center at CDC in a public health field. Also, uh, from an educational academic point of view, uh, from an international perspective where I've had a lot of experience, and finally as an advocate of One Health. So I'm kind of a mile wide and an inch deep. But I've seen this uh, from many different perspectives, and I really am convinced that the multi-perspective view is the only way that we're going to come to any kind of workable solution. Um, I, I intend to be somewhat provocative, not to make you at mad or angry, but just to start stimulating the conversation and the dialogue, which is going to be so important as you work for a final outcome uh, in this um, symposium. Uh, we're going to push you a little bit out of comfort zone and hopefully just have you think in different ways. I have a very strong personal feeling that this is one of the, the most single important issues that is facing animal agriculture, plant agriculture, and public health today. I also believe in this format and process. I think you'll very much enjoy working with Daniel uh, and our team as you really uh, go through the process of uh, building consensus and finding common ground. And lastly, I do believe this issue, as difficult as it is, can be absolutely feasibly uh, possible to actually make um, a very important progress, even though it's growing more difficult by the day. So I still think um, that we can get a lot done. Before I start again, I want to also acknowledge uh, the planning committee in particular, uh, Dr. Leah Dorman and Dr. Jennifer Komen who I've had the pleasure of working with. I knew them before. They're wonderful um, young veterinarians who uh, have really knocked themselves out to put this on. Uh, also, my thanks to Katie Ambrose and the planning committee, Daniel Stone, and my colleagues at Ohio State University that are really going to help with this, uh, with this process. So let's give it a, a, an introduction. And this is my view of the world of antimicrobial resistance with the caveats um, that I just presented. So antibiotic Anti uh, antibiotic resistance is never going to go away, and the struggle against antibiotic resistance is a war that we will never completely win. However, there are key battles that we should and must win, and although humanity has been waging war against microbial world, the world on an esca escalating scale since the discovery of antibiotics, resistance will always prevail. Thus, we're forced to coexist with antimicrobial resistance. The strength of trillions upon trillions of microbes combined with ancient forces of evolution constantly and unrelentingly relentingly, uh, will cause variation and inevitably overpower the drugs that we find. Antibiotics merely present another evolutionary challenge that microbes must survive or perish. Darwin had it right. The fittest actually do survive. And in our very interconnected world of today, we have certainly given them a great comparative advantage. Yet the problem can be greatly improved. We can coexist with this inherent imbalance. And like the microbes themselves, we need to constantly adapt, to change, to improve our position, to maintain and improve the health of people, animals, and our environment. So some bacterial species are unsusceptible to particular drugs and consequently are naturally resistant. Species that were once sensitive but eventually became resistant are said to be and have acquired resistance. It's important to note that acquired resistance affects only a subset of strains in the entire group of species. That's why the prevalence of acquired resistance in a species or different species is different depending on where the location is. Antimicrobial resistance, which is the acquired ability of an organism or a pathogen to withstand an antibiotic that kills off its sensitive counterparts, 
originally arises from random mutations in existing genes or from intact genes that already have similar purpose. Exposure to antibiotics or antimicrobial products, whether in the human body and animals or in our environment, applies selective pressure that encourages resistance to emerge, favoring both natural resistance strains and strains which have acquired their resistance. One of the big game changers that we found some time ago was horizontal gene transfer in which genetic information is passed between microbes, allows resistant determinants to spread within harmless environmental or commensal microorganisms and pathogens, thus creating an ongoing reservoir of resistance. Resistance is also spread by the replication of microbes that carry, of course, resistant genes in a process that produces identical or clonal progeny. Resistance is commonly considered simplistic. Either an organism is or it isn't. In reality, that's not true. Resistance exists really as a gradient, reflecting the phenotype and the genotype variations in the natural microbial populations. Resistance is often portrayed as an undesirable consequence of antibiotic use and misuse. Again, this view is simplistic and inaccurate. The rate of antibiotic resistance emergence is related to all uses of drugs not just the misuse. And the total amounts of antibiotics used in the environment also play pivotal roles in determining resistance. The main driving factor behind resistance may actually be a lack of adequate hygiene and sanitation, which has really enabled a rapid proliferation and spread of pathogens worldwide. So antibiotics have dramatically improved animal, plant, and public health. Antibiotics have enabled millions of people to live longer and more productive lives. They've dramatically lowered, lowered child and infant mortality rates, particularly in the developing world, and spurred the acceleration of population growth in, I think, by increasing um, life expectancy by almost seven years. So the very success of these drugs has often resulted in a cavalier attitude toward prescribing them, since antibiotics can miraculously cure the most dreadful of all infections, and the potential to develop resistance is often overlooked, and we find ourselves standing with a problem today. Antibiotics have also allowed for a significant decrease in disease morbidity, mortality, and benefits to all of our animal populations. And they have been underappreciated with regard to productivity gains across animal and plant agriculture. The threat of antimicrobial resistance is subtle, it's complex, it's difficult, and it can be polarizing. It's a very hard topic, I think, to grasp, to understand, or even to convey to most audiences. The important messages about antimicrobial resistance are not getting across, not even to scientists or infectious disease specialists, let alone to other stakeholders and the public. We need innovative and effective communications as part of our strategy going forward. So 20 years ago, the specter of potentially untreatable bacterial infections started to appear on the horizon. Today, we've recreated a planetary environment often saturated with immense quantities of antimicrobial agents deployed in human, animal, and plant health. The extent of multidrug resistance seemingly have caught us by surprise. But in retrospect, this antibiotic era had two really underlying cardinal sins. One is the neglect and at times the complete abandonment of preventive measures in favor of a single-minded antibiotic strategy against bacterial infection. I think that's the biggest problem that started this. Secondly, I think it was the failure to seriously consider consequences of the fact that overwhelmingly the majority of our most effective antibiotics and the resistant mechanisms are actually products from the microbial world themselves. Thus, they're inherently designed to play the game and to win. The resistance of therapeutics is certainly not a new phenomenon amongst microbes. I think while this is not surprising, they've learned to evolve, to adapt, and survive, and they're capable of doing so rapidly because of their simple genomes. They have the capacity for interspecies exchange, genetic material encoding for resistance, and have the further advantage of relatively short reproductive cycles. What is surprising and notable is the increasing degree to which microbial resistance has become an important global health threat 
and to the continuing failure to mount an effective response. So the goal, I think, of this symposium is not to kind of lament what shortcomings we've had or point fingers or blame. It really is to gather and pursue new understandings of the relationships between microbes, disease vectors, and hosts, and identify new strategies to meet this very significant global health problem, and just as importantly, to construct a better process and environment to come to agreement and implement effective actions. So this symposium, as Tony said, is really built on some unique components. The format is designed to take advantage of your expertise and your perspectives through small interactive group discussions. Secondly, it's planned to encourage the development of consensual action. And thirdly, hopefully, to use a One Health framework to create a better dialogue and help to create a more effective path forward. So with that as kind of an introduction, let me go ahead and kind of delve into this in a little more detail. So my objectives of what's left of my time is to provide a background and afford questions to stimulate the dialogue over the next two days. To provide you with a One Health framework to help structure that dialogue. To discuss barriers to productive dialogue, consensual solutions, and the key elements to how we are, I think, going to have to overcome them and to offer some ideas about defining and building common ground, what that is, what those are, to help stimulate the conversation, and then at the end, defining what success should look like to you when you walk out. So those are the objectives that I have. We did the acknowledgments in the back. Let me move through the background. So the world we live in is similar, I think, and can be explained by an old English term called connexity. It's a term that actually talks about the fusion of our interconnected world and how complex our world is. So connexity to me explains antimicrobial resistance. It's multifaceted, it's pro profound, and it is deeply complex. I think I consider, this is from my perspective, antimicrobial resistant organisms as part of the emerging infectious emerging disease complex. And I'll talk a little bit more about that why these infectious diseases continue and why they're accelerating, why, why antimicrobial resistance is, in my view, uh, what we call a wicked problem, what that is and how do we overcome that, and that antimicrobial resistance has societal effects in addition to just physiological effects, and that kind of comes with some of, the, of uh, the emotions that go along with the topic. And the concept of ecologies of resistance with selective pressure really talks about the One Health strategy to really understand this and that need then for a different perspective to gain common ground through One Health. Again, my view, antimicrobial resistance will occur and does occur without antibiotic use at all. It also occurs with judicious issues, but especially with misuse and overuse. And microbial resistance is not surprising, but the speed, the scope, and the impact, especially over the last decade, last decade, really are. Unfortunately, the 1960s and 70s suggested that the era of infectious diseases were over. It's 1967 that the um, Surgeon General, William Stewart, made the announcement that the world of infectious diseases was over because of antimicrobial agents and vaccines. Slightly premature. It also did a lot, I think, to really, really harmed the output of what we should be doing at that point in time. And he also said in 1967, we had to turn our attention to cancer. So he was ahead of his time to a certain extent, but not to all extents. And also that disease control, prevention, and sanitation were de-emphasized because people believed that the cure was at hand. And that still is with us today as we move forward. Also, the dictum of clinical findings, the rejection of causality and a favor of association, which means whether you're a physician, a veterinarian, a nurse, pharmacist, all the way down the line in terms of health professionals, right? We, we have to understand that um, um, these tools, antimicrobial agents, right, cannot be used indiscriminately, and they have. There's been a 40 or 50 year gap with minimal discovery and approval of new drugs. 
we need to talk about how to correct that, and certainly the incentives are not right. This is a remarkable time of science. Great possibilities of research with new possibilities for breakthrough, innovative discoveries and findings. We also need to support that research and the R&D as we move forward. So a person that I had a great deal of respect for, the Nobel laureate Joshua Lederberg, said in an article in Science Magazine in the year 2000, it's our wits versus their genes. He also founded the IOM Committee on uh, the Forum of Microbial Threats. So think about that over the next couple days. It's our wits versus their genes. And frankly, the cards are stacked against us. So these are the major classes of antimicrobials in the year of their discovery. So if you look back to really the heyday, all the way back from serum, before we even knew about antibiotics, as we move forward, right, to the golden age in the late 40s, the 1950s, the golden age of antimicrobials, and then look how many new agents have actually been brought to the market in the last half century. Okay. Therein lies one of our problems. And in a One Health point of view, these are the connected antimicrobial ecosystems that are now fusing together that makes this world more complex and complicated and the solutions more complicated. We have a clinical ecosystem, right? which is really where the high selection pressure of, an, of, uh, an, of microbes take place. We have a non-clinical ecosystem, kind of the medium selective pressure. And then the environment itself, a low resistance gene uh, selection and pressure. But these are now fusing together where resistant genes and mobile elements are moving amongst and between these elements. It really is a One Health uh, complex problem, and that's where the solution needs to come from. So why is this actually part of what I believe is the emergence of infectious diseases? Right? So a little bit ago, the Institute of Medicine talked about the perfect microbial storm. The conditions were just right, whether they were genetic, physical, environmental, social, political, ecological, to create the right elements. Right. for organisms to actually become not only resistant, but for new organisms to emerge. And we had the era of new emerging infectious diseases starting about 30 years ago, and we all know the result where 75% of all new human infections over the last three decades have been involved with or through animals, and that antimicrobial resistance has been part of that. This is uh, just a graph or a chart that came out of Kate Jones's um, article some time ago in Nature, where she talked about global trends in emerging infectious diseases. And she looked at 335 emerging infectious diseases starting since the 1940s, moving into uh, this decade, right? Uh, and as you can see that every year, the number of infectious emerging diseases have gone up. And 1980 was really the, the, the decade of the, of the heyday of new emergence because of HIV. And the chart on the left really shows where the dark lines are organisms that are not drug resistant, and the white are organisms that are resistant. So these are anti antimicrobial resistant organisms. And she shows then the increasing number of emerging infections that she describes as antimicrobial resistant organisms. The one on the right, by the way, just is vector-borne diseases. And she, in her classification, she believes that almost 21% of new emerging infectious diseases are drug-resistant microbes. And the organisms and the, or the, the conditions that have created that, right, are still very much in place. This is one of her charts. If you looked at the upper left-hand corner, that's a look at zoonotic pathogens that are involved from wildlife going to see where those are, where the red and, and orange are, are the high incidence, where B are the top right are zoonotic pathogens from non-wildlife, mostly from domestic animals, and the lower left are drug-resistant pathogens. And she's tracked these, and by and large, they really come from large areas of population. The one on the right, lower right, is vector-borne pathogens. So these are being tracked. So why do these diseases emerge? It's because of genetic and biological factors. These microbes have always adapted. They've always changed. They've always become resistant. 
There's new susceptibility in humans, how they use antimicrobial agents and how they misuse them, also in animals. There's a physical environmental factors which are part of this. Those certainly the economic development of land, land use, in particular infectious uh, diseases. Ecological factors, especially human demographics and behaviors. And if there's one thing that has driven this acceleration and resistance in emerging infectious disease, it's that. And then the social, political, and economic factors. Poverty, social inequity, lack of political will, which I'm going to talk about, is a huge issue, which is a barrier for us to move forward. So we wake up this morning with a triple threat to health. A threat to animal health, a threat to environmental health, and a threat effect to human health. And they're all interspersed together, right? And as our world is more complex and interconnected, the solution also is not only um, uh, really needs all of these to the table, and really we talk about then the new convergence of human health, animal health, and environmental health, as looking at these as a collective and an integrated strategy, a holistic look that we determine and call One Health. So this is a time where the scale and complexity of animal and human medical problems embedded in a changing environment demand that scientists move beyond the confines of their own disciplines and explore new organizational models for the team, really for team science. And that's where the solution to this very difficult problem is going to come from. So to me, it is One Health. This is the definition we used uh, from the the start of the AVMA's um, task force and commission on One Health. One Health is the collaborative effort of multiple disciplines working locally, nationally, and globally to attain optimal health of humans, animals, and our environment. And that optimal health has to do also with antimicrobial resistance. Thus, One Health, I think, is the right construct to think about uh, and, I think, for new common ground. One Health is not a new concept. It was probably, I think, greater acceptance before the era of specialization. Uh, and it, it's a problem that I'm going to talk about in just a second called a wicked problem. And wicked problems demand new thinking and new solutions. And I think that's what the common ground is about. It's about the triple threat to health. We talked about that. And living in a world that's exquisitely interconnected in ways that we've never seen before. The acceleration of intensification of human-animal interface and the interface with our environment. This is a global phenomenon. And One Health is kind of counter to the current medical training in our education, right? That really drives us more toward specialization. And there's a new emphasis on prevention, which is absolutely necessary as we kind of uh, move upstream. So what's a wicked problem? Well, a wicked problem is actually comes from a business term. Right? And wicked problems often crop up in organizations. It could be this one. It could be organizations back home. It could be Ohio State University, and believe me, it is. Where constant change and unparalleled challenges. They often occur in social contexts with diverse opinions from numerous stakeholders. Does that sound like ARM? If it is, it's starting to be a wicked problem. And wickedness is not about the difficulty, although this is a difficult problem but rather represents issues, <clears throat> issues that traditional processes can't resolve. Old solutions don't solve new problems if they're wicked. So that means new thinking, a new common ground as we move forward. So wicked issues are complex and tangled. They're unprecedented. They're difficult to define and enigmatic. Solutions are not yes or no, but multiple options often generate unexpected consequences, unique where past experiences are not necessarily helpful. And they're threatening. Threatening human health, animal health, and environmental health. They're often symptomatic of other issues and problems, and this one is. And I believe this is a descriptive of antimicrobial resistance. If it is, it's a wicked problem, and it means that old solutions and old thinking won't work. So I hope at this symposium, that this will be in part a stimulus to think about this as a wicked problem and start devising different strategies. So I'm going to present to you five questions. And I'm going to give you hints from my point of view 
of kind of the in-depth what those questions are as we move forward. Where do we find ourselves today and how did we get here? What are the consequences of not acting or resolving this issue? What needs to be done to create and implement an effective action or define a common ground? What are the barriers to effective action and how might we overcome them? And finally, what are your challenges? What are your challenges over the next couple days that will determine a successful symposium when you walk out of here? So let's kind of start down those questions. So where do we find ourselves and kind of how did we arrive at this point? Well, AMR has become a very significant and growing threat to health. I don't think anybody uh, probably disagrees with that. It's adding profound cost, especially to health care, and that's growing. And maybe our physician colleagues will say more about that. We face a big problem that's rapidly getting bigger and will continue to accelerate with inaction. AMR, AMR can be a polarizing issue, and because it is, it also becomes more difficult to find an attractive solution or solutions. Society seems to be at a major impasse. And the cost and impact, I believe, of inaction are now unacceptable. They probably were before, but especially now. This problem is going to get more advanced and more difficult. It's a huge global problem. And I believe that the acceleration of this problem has kind of left the shores of this country, although it's still here. And we are going to see a new acceleration in antimicrobial resistance that we've never seen before. And that's going to take place because of misuse and overuse right, in countries that don't have good regulations, in developing countries with increased wealth that are going to have more access to drugs and more potential poor quality of drugs with lack of regulation, right, and counterfeit drugs, which we're already finding. We also know with Livestock 2020 and the increase in wealth in the developing world that the demand for protein from animal sources will increase by about 50% in the next decade and a half. 50%. So between 20 and 30 billion food animals, we're going to have to throw another 15 or into the system, right? And guess where those are going to be? And guess what the access is to those drugs? And we're 7 billion people by the middle of the century going to 9 billion. So you don't think that the microbes don't see this as a wonderful opportunity? They do. And we also, I think, see in developing world by their very nature and lack of resources, very poor sanitation and preventive strategies. So if you wanted to set up in a perfect agenda and scenario for this very difficult problem to accelerate, that's it. So is there a sense of urgency to do something about this? And that sense of urgency has to be an international strategy, not just what we think about it in this country. The need for new drugs has greatly outpaced the development and approval of such products. No question about it. The cost and the difficulty of getting new drugs approved have led pharmaceutical companies away from the risk. Some believe that antimicrobial resistance is an example of the tragedy of the commons, and I'm going to talk about that in just a second, of while rational action actually can cause long-term problems. Others believe that antimicrobial resistance is analogous to our energy situation, where we really have um, a scarce commodity, and we have to treat it that way. A whole different way of kind of looking at this. The use of antimicrobials has resulted in real benefits. Sometimes we forget, you know, what society and how society has benefited. There's been huge benefits, both on the animal and human health side. And by the way, there will continue to be. But sometimes we pass that by and run to the kind of the conflictive part um, of this issue. Stalemates multiply threats and compound the difficulty of meeting solutions. So even when different groups agree that something should be done, without the right processes in place, nothing does happen. Stalemates occur. They get more difficult to kind of overcome. And the solution becomes even more difficult. 
That's a wicked problem. So the tragedy of the commons really came out of an ecological kind of a context. It's a metaphor to really kind of understand catastrophes that have happened in the environment, where intertwined, intertwined challenges spawned by the accelerated human scale of activity have produced major problems, right? A tragedy of the commons is a serious dilemma where individual rational behavior, let me underline that, rational behavior, right? acting without constraint to maximize personal short-term uh, short gain can actually cause long-term harm to the environment, to others, and ultimately to oneself. And that's exactly, in my opinion, what's happened. So has AMR been catalyzed by rational behavior? I think so. And at the time, we really were focused on short-term gain, which was not unreasonable, by the way. But we didn't appreciate the longer-term consequences of that behavior over time. And now we have to pay the piper. So if this is true, if this is a tragedy at the commons in that perspective, then is it really rational any longer? It's a question. So some people think that this ought to be looked at a whole different way of policy, right? It's, it's not in the realm of science, right? It really is about viewing antimicrobials and their use like we, like we view energy. A limited, valuable resource to be conserved, used where needed, and for which new sources need to be identified and exploited. I think that opens up whole new possibilities and strategies. So what are the consequences, our next question, of inaction? Well, enormous costs to society and the healthcare continue to es escalate. And I've seen all kinds of figures, but they're billions of dollars. Right? And the inability to use an antibiotic in a way that we really need to use it at times. There are both short-term and long-term impact on relationships. Right. And I think that's a huge issue in animal agriculture and plant agriculture. I think we will get caught up because of this problem right now and not resolving it into long-term impacts and relationships that we're going to need down the road as we face even more societal problems. There, needs, there will be a greater focus on winning and losing rather than inventing all-gain strategy. The longer it goes, the more people tend to kind of put set their heels, and it gets more and more difficult to overcome. And consequence of the act in action is there's more likely to be a shift to third parties, not the groups affected to make decisions, like regulatory and legislative action. And the longer the inaction, the less likely to find satisfactory outcomes. Right. The longer the inaction, the less likely to find satisfactory outcomes. And I'm going to talk really briefly about rights, powers, and interests. There'll be a reduction in improving health in all domains, animals, plants, and humans, without doing something about that. And I believe, and I'm a real advocate and really believe myself to be an agriculturalist, first and foremost, that agriculture has the greatest vulnerability and downside risk. No question in my mind. That if we aren't at the table and involved in actively and proactively resolving this problem, right, that we have the most probably, I think, to lose. And we're not trying to put this in a win-lose category. Extreme vulnerability. So what needs to be done to create effective action and define common ground? I think we really need to step back and reframe the problem, look at different options for resolution, thinking about using One Health. Over the next two days, I want you to really step back and think in much larger dimensions. Put yourselves in the shoes of people in many other different perspectives, whether they're public health, environment, the public itself, agencies, researchers, so that we can really truly understand and reflect on this. So focus on creating mutually satisfying outcomes and interests. Right? So it's about mutual gains, it's not about victories. And from Ohio State University in football, that's pretty hard for me to utter those words. It's not about victory. It is about gaining, right, mutual gains. 
and I'm going to talk about this kind of a Gaussian analysis. There's another concept in organizations called the burning platform, and I'm going to refer to that in a minute. It's about when do we actually get a sense of urgency to act. Now, I think we have a burning platform now, and I'm going to check that with you. Should we do more studies or take action or do both? Now, I support research, always have, always will, but do we need another study? I mean, what we do in universities. Or is there enough known at this point to take effective action and still have good research that actually needs and, and needs to be done? So scientists and researchers, by their very nature, are skeptics. Right? And that's okay, because that's why they're good at doing that. But it's not very good at solving problems, and especially bringing in mutual gains and conflict resolution. So trust has to be earned. We can't just kind of wait for it to happen. And we have to shift to common ground in the midst of other issues. We have to tease this problem out, right, of being in the morass of a whole lot of other society issues in order to focus on it. Otherwise, you can't really get your arms around it. So the burning platform really took place in uh, 1988 off the coast of Scotland where an oil rig caught on fire. There was 239 people on that rig, 159 died. And the ones that survived jumped 150 feet into the cold North Sea, some of which, some of whom did not survive. So the whole issue was it's death or probable death. Take your choice. Now, I think we're quite there, but it is about a sense of urgency and a burning platform. When do we have enough information? When is it serious enough to take that leap, right? I don't think it's a probable death, by the way. But I do think it's time to say, we just can't not jump. So that's the burning platform. And if I think about kind of organizations and people, if you took a broad perspective of the public, this is the Gaussian binomial curve that we know in terms of distributions, where the centerpiece is kind of average or median, right? Two standard deviations is about two-thirds of whatever population you're studying. Another standard, standard deviation will add another 25%. And then you have a third standard deviation, which are really on the ends. And if I think about this, you know, I think that one standard, standard deviation from the middle, if you will, is where the action is going to be. That is really where the interests are and where we're going to gain the most. As we move further and further out, to think of this issue is, is it's my right, or this is a power struggle that we're going to find out who's more powerful. Those are, learning, those are losing propositions. But the further you get out on the curve, the more ideological people are and the more difficult it is to bring it together. I don't think we're like that, but we're, Congress is. No, we shouldn't say that. So there's a great book by Roger Fisher and William Urey. It's called Getting to Yes, and it's just a simple little book, and I really believe in it. All right? And I thought about it when... I've come to this um, symposium. And they would say, you know, how do you resolve this? How do you actually make gains? And they would say, first of all, separate people from problems. There's nothing personal about this. It's not about you. It's not about me, right? Be hard on the problem and soft about people. Right? Don't get into dialogues about them or point fingers, right? It's the problem that we're, at, that we're trying to solve. Focus on interest and not positions. That's hard to do. So if you're in a negotiation, your position doesn't matter. It matters to you, but we want to gain, you know, we want to gain the interest. So you have to focus on interest here. Indicate options for mutual gain, and you invent these options before you run to the conclusion. So wait until you have an answer before, wait till you put all the options on the table. Use objective criteria, and know what's called a BATA, a BATNA, right? the best alternative to no agreement. So as we sit there and think about this as a strategy, whether you're public health or animal health or academe or what have you, think about, as I'm coming to the table and helping resolve this, what my position for unilateral action is. Okay. And you need to know then, strong batons, I think, make for better agreements. So if all organizations have pretty strong options for unilateral action, right, people are really brought to the table with kind of equal force. 
exploring options, first of all. And then I think what really it comes down to is really a salient truth. And that salient truth is consensual solutions are only better and will only be accepted if stakeholders are confident that they will achieve more in a negotiated agreement than a unilateral action, i.e., you have to achieve more than your bet. So you have to achieve more than what you can walk away with. So think about that, and if it's your personal inner, you know, unilateral action is actually better than a, a mutual solution. So your interests, what are interests? Well, they're our needs. They're what we desire. They're our concerns. They're our fears. They're our aspirations. And as you go through this process the next two days, I think you have to prioritize what those are. And so I think AMR is really kind of a dispute. Right? It's a public forum. It's a, it's a public dis uh, uh, dispute in a, in a, a large forum. Right? And interests are what we really care about and want. I certainly do. Rights are who's right, i.e. who's wrong. Right? So think about that. Have you thought that way? Who's right in this? I'm right and they're wrong, vice versa. Right? And that generally is handled through arbitration or adjudication. You know, that starts to get away from interest, starts to get more legalese, if you will. And then finally, power, where there are those coercing others to do something that you wouldn't do otherwise. It's kind of threatening. So which approach is best? Right? Do you want to take an interest approach, a rights approach, or a power approach? And if you think about these, there are costs in all of them. Time, energy, money. There's satisfaction of outcome. So which is outcome is going to be more satisfactory? There's effect on relationships, short term and long term. And I can't overemphasize that from my point of view. That the resolution and part of antimicrobial resistance will go a long way in agriculture to really help propel us in terms of stronger, longer term solutions on very difficult problems, whether it's animal welfare, uh, environment, and other issues that we grapple with. And the recurrence, does this solution really stick? So we need to think about those as we move forward. It's less costly and more rewarding to focus on interests and rights and then to focus on rights, which in turn is less costly and more rewarding than focusing on power. So what would the outcome be for animal agriculture in a rights or power dispute based on public sentiment today? I think I know the answer to that. And it would be very rewarding. Right? So this is not about who's more powerful, it's not about who's right or who has the right, it really is about mutual interest as we move forward. So some people say, well, th this is really a compromise. You, you know, you really just split the baby here. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think that's the wrong outcome. I, I think it's the wrong thinking, right? Compromise connotes that everyone will give something up and further suggests that an outcome focusing on meeting everyone's minimal result. Minimal results are not very satisfying. Therefore, I think it's better to strive for an agreement that comes as close as possible to everybody's interests and your highest aspirations. That's the outcome, right? And I think groups can get there, right? It's not about a compromise. It's about getting as much of your interest out and also for people that have their interest, right? The next question, what are the barriers to effective action and how can they be overcome? What's keeping us collectively or as a society from really grabbing a hold and doing something about that? Well, complex problems often have complex answers. That's too bad, but that is the way it is, and this is complex both in its understanding and its in resolution. This is more than about science and studies and R&D, which are helpful, right? It really is about politics, big P, little p politics, behavior, economics, and conflict. Sounds like a soap opera. But it really is. And we need to understand all of those components, if you will, not just science and evidence, although that's important. The critical part, I think, for us in agriculture is to change the game. We have the ability to change the game. 
and you change the game by getting to yes, right? Changing maybe your best alternative to what you think is a unilateral action, right? And that can be done. As I hear people talk about this, I hear people talking about facts versus perceived facts. Well, here's a study, but I don't see it that way. We often prefer to believe what we prefer to be true. That's the inherent bias in all of us. We often right, prefer to believe what we prefer to be true. It's really difficult to step out of that and change one's thinking. I have a hard time with it, for sure. And you'll get escalation of this problem. AMR is caught up in a network of other societal issues that evoked motions, anger. We have to disentangle this problem from this morass of other issues. It's hard enough to work on, and we need to pull it out and talk about it separately rather than all the other issues that people will bring into the conversation. Compromise is not the same as mutual interest, and common ground is how to break this impasse. So common ground, I'm going to give you just a few of my common issues of common ground. So what is common ground? What's well, a basis agreed to by all participants for reaching a mutual understanding? It's a foundation of common interest. It's something people can agree to when they disagree on other issues. I reminded my wife of that yesterday when we were looking for cars. Something people can agree to when they disagree on other issues. Right? That is teasing this out. So I'm going to give you just some ideas, right? And this is to be provocative. But if I were going to be sitting around here the next two days, and I am going to be in and out and listening and you know, waiting and, and uh, looking forward to it, here are some things that people have thrown out in the common ground. Consider specific classes of antibiotics reserved just for animals or just for people. Determine incentives for pharmaceutical companies for discovering new products and bringing them to market. There ought to be a national forum and symposium in Washington, D.C. about how we look at incentives differently so this can get done. It's not helping. Develop, implement, and adopt international strategies for usage. Good grief. If the problem is global, it can't be just about us than the U.S. But I think we have a leadership role to really look at the international standards of the use of these products. Improve data collection and sharing to ensure earlier detection of resistance in order to make adjustments. Integrative surveillance strategies. You're going to listen about NARMS and some other things about where that has been successfully done. A big issue that has actually, I think, brought several sides into conflict. Incorporate the use and plans for new vaccines. This is the decade of the vaccines. Great science, great possibilities, uh, Gates Foundation talks about the decade of the vaccines. This is a wonderful time and adjunct to talking about common ground and how we go forward on these problems. To stimulate and emphasize disease control, prevention, and sanitation to reduce the need for usage. I think that was the original sin that actually set us on this path. Mandate training for all health professionals in judicious use of antimicrobials and all health science students. I think in veterinary medicine it ought to be part of their standards for accreditation in veterinary and medical education. This has in part been done, but we need to do more. Adopt strategies and drugs for targeted use. Okay. That is the new move afoot in treating cancer today. Not broad spectrum, very toxic uh, treatments, right? But now very narrow perspectives for individual cells or tumors, right, that we've not had before. Wonderful breakthroughs in science. But if we look at adopting strategies for more targeted use, which could be enormously helpful, we're also assuming really good diagnosis or, or diagnostics that are reasonable in price and the duration of the use of antimicrobial agents. Adopt a One Health mindset and construct from across all domains and interests involving their interests and concerns in the final solution. So my last group of common ground. Place agreements and solutions clearly in front of decision makers, national organizations, and agencies. There has to be a political will to move forward, and it's essential. 
this organism, this organization does that well. But we need to actually stick this up in the noses. That's not a good term. We need to put this in front of the noses of people that are going to make decisions about it. Create and implement a new educational campaign. We've done some of that. We need to do much more. Develop a new economic model. Sponsor and hold a national forum on the topic and decide on leadership and followership roles in this organization. So thinking about common ground, an aim for mutual satisfaction, not victories. This is not personal, right? It's about interest. Suspend reactions, emotions, and distrust at a time when it's most difficult. It's never about your position. It's about your interest, mine too. There are facts and perceived facts, right? So be careful about quoting facts. Be clear on the implications for not agreeing. What's your BATNA? What's your unilateral approach? Is that worthwhile? The greatest power is to change the game. And changing the game is turning adversaries into partners, shifting from intractable issues to new perspectives and options that can be done. Our world is always in conflict. Relationships and organizations are in conflict. They always will occur. It's how we resolve them with minimal cost and the greatest benefit. Right? So we can learn, change, and improve just because we have conflict. This is one of my favorite quotes from a, a French diplomat who said, diplomacy is the art of letting someone have your way. It's a whole different idea about going about this, right? Letting someone have your way. By the way, I think it can be done. In closing, your challenges for the next two days and what does success look like? Begin with the end in mind. It's always about improving health, animal health, human health, and environmental health. Right? That's the goal. It's the outcome. We need to keep our eye on the ball. Use a One Health mindset and perspective. Think bigger and broader dimensions over the next two days. Participate fully. This is a very unique symposium. My compliments to NIA for doing this. The results are depending on you, not the presenters. To find the common ground and the interest that you have, but for all. Recommend concrete and actionable outcomes. And you may not obtain your position, but I think you can satisfy your interest. You may not obtain your position, but I think you can satisfy your interest. So invent a whole portfolio of options. And at the end of the day, everyone should leave with a better understanding of the depth and serious nature of ARM, of AMR and a new mindset to help address this issue. Secondly, everyone should leave with the knowledge that even though this is a wicked problem, it can be successfully ameliorated, although not necessarily completely resolved. And that's okay. This symposium can serve then as a critical link from your symposium last year in the white paper into definitive action. So, that's my message to you as a non-expert, but somebody who's watched this kind of unfold for a long time. And I really strongly believe that we can come to the table and actually help resolve this in ways that we haven't done before. Thank you for your kind indulgence.